Good afternoon and welcome to Prep to Plate, the show where we take a look at what prep goes into new restaurants and the food that is served. Today we'll take a look at the prep that goes into a miso soup and beef short ribs. Today joining me are Tom Strini from Third Coast Digest. Hi, uh, Greg, thanks for inviting me. Thanks for coming. And Jim Udelich, uh, an art, culinary arts instructor here at MATC. I'm glad to be here. So let's take a look at our first dish, uh, miso soup with mushroom dumplings. I went to China for two weeks, and and in those two weeks, the ultimate goal was to to take influences from China, not not exact things that I had in China, the the influence and and the the feeling, and not only the feeling of the food, but the feeling of the restaurant that we were at, the people who served us, and and the environment that we were in, the town we were in, and 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 take that lay an underlying current of an American palate underneath it and then throw on, throw on that essence of, of what happened in, in, to me in, in China. So it was accessible to the people that, that, that are here in, in Shorewood and in Milwaukee and for that matter in Wisconsin and, uh, and give them you know, my, my interpretation of, of what I got to experience in China. Because there was a lot of things in, in China that I don't think, that I don't think are, are um, accessible to people here in, in Wisconsin, for sure. Um, I, I, did want, uh, I did want them to get a sense of, of what I went through. But this is just the beginning. We're we're actually going to take them even farther. This is uh, this is this is just the beginning for us. I don't, I don't think we brought any innovation at all yet. Um, I think that's our ultimate goal. I, I think that we're going to get to innovation. Um, again, I, I think we first off have to focus on fundamentals. I think we have to concentrate on, uh, on, on tradition. But we need to kick off the shackles of tradition to get to, to, get to innovation. We, 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 haven't, we haven't done that yet. Um, but we need to gain the, the security and we need to gain the trust of the people in, in, in Shorewood and indeed Milwaukee. We need to get them to trust us to do that before we can get there. So we're, you know, in essence, taking them on a journey with us. I'm not sure that, that you achieve a style of cooking. I believe that, uh, that cooking is reactive. You have, to, you have to be able to adapt to what's happening around you. I, I think if you have the fundamentals of, of cooking, you're able to adapt to the surroundings that you are in, in any immediate sense. If, if this street is doing, Mexican food, um, they're doing Italian food, they're doing pizza, they're doing, um, and, and you open up a restaurant or you're involved in a restaurant, I think you have to fit in within that little microcosm of, of cooking. Um, I don't believe that, I don't believe that you, you determine 
your your style of cooking or or what you want to do or impose on the world in, until you have fundamentals and and I was fortunate enough to work under a chef that that, that gave me fundamentals and, and allowed me to to adapt to the circumstances I was involved in. Tom, why don't you tell us a little bit about your interest in food and uh, a little bit more about yourself? And Well, my background is in music and theater. My degrees are in music. I wrote about music and dance uh, and theater and other things for the paper for 27 years. And now I'm a, a culture editor and part owner of thirdcoastdigest.com, the online magazine. But food has always been a big interest of mine. Um, my wife doesn't like to cook, and I love to cook. So it's a nice division of labor from her point of view. And my default position at home cooking is probably Spanish, French, Italian. That's sort of where I fall back when I pull ingredients out and see what I have, I usually end up somewhere in the Mediterranean. That's nice. And, and Jim, um, probably uh, the harshest critic here at the table. Um, oh, I don't, I, don't, I don't know if I'd go that far. <laughs> Tell but, us a little bit uh, about I, it. I love good food just as much as everybody else. But yeah, my background is I started out and I've never done anything other than being a chef. I, I started out in, uh, when I was 15 years old and worked my way up through the ranks like a lot, a lot of other chefs. and. Um, in 1990, I, I went to the Culinary Institute of America, and that really catapulted not only my career, but my, my love for food. It really opened up all those avenues for ingredients, and I, and I love the fact that we're here talking about miso soup today, because I, the, what my favorite class in school was the Asian cooking class we had, and it was, I, there was so much more to know. And, and uh, I just, uh, but my background really is more in traditional French, being classically trained, and the, the, being an instructor, we teach to the classical French. And my, I really, uh, my background predominantly is working with a Midwest regional. I worked for Odessa Piper at L'Etoile for eight years out of culinary school, oh, and working nice. from the local farmers markets, and, and uh, you know, applying those French techniques to, to all the you know, great produce and, and meat and, and fish that we have here in Wisconsin has been just a, a phenomenal thing to be able to, to see what other chefs do. Yeah, it does seem to be getting better as far as local sourcing and everything. That's, right. that's great. Um, well, today I, I made a, uh, a miso soup. It's, um, it's not a traditional miso soup in that uh, traditionally miso is, is uh, less sweet. We uh, do a, a pear and ginger infusion in this, and then we do an American style mushroom dumpling. Um, and and I would love for you guys to just you know grab a little taste and and tell me what you think, and then we can kind of talk a little bit more about it. Mm. Well, Very I was nice. just in your place on Saturday night, so this is mm. this is familiar to me, and we were we were knocked out by it the other night. It's uh, it's a really interesting combination of salt and sweet, and a different kind of dumpling than you'd expect. And it reflects sort of what exactly what you were saying about combining American uh, aspects and even a little German side to it. So could you, how would this differ from a more traditional um, Asian, uh, Asian dumpling, for example? What's, what's different about it? Well, an, an Asian dumpling, generally that the, the connotation there is, is that you're gonna, have a, you're gonna have a wrapper around so, some sort of filling. Um, we wanted to do do something that that um, that again was a, a little bit more familiar to, to to people in our region, and and this is a German culture that we uh, that we live in here, and so this just seemed natural. Um, to make it a little bit sweeter was uh, was just something that we we kind of played around with. We wanted to separate our, our miso soup um, from from a traditional one in, in more than one aspect, and, and that was to do the dumpling and to, to sweeten mm -hmm. it up a little bit. Um, but yeah, that's how that came about. Well, and I know that uh, you say that this is not traditional, but there are ingredients in here with the, with the miso itself that you really, um, there's something special about it, and, and it has a certain allure, I know, as a chef myself. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about uh, what that special thing is and how to handle miso? Um, well, miso, miso comes in, in, well, let's start with what miso is, I, I guess. Um, miso is, is 
generally a grain of some sort, uh, rice or, or barley, wheat, um, and, and it is then mixed with soybo so soybeans and then fermented. Um, it's, they add a fungus to it and ferment it. Um, it's, so it's a living culture, um, much like uh, yogurt is. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. The idea um, then for miso soup is that, is that you don't want to kill that, 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 that bacteria that's in it, the living organism. So you, you do want to uh, take the miso, you, you want to add it last and, and mix it in so, so that you do get all the, the, the benefits, the health benefits that, uh, that, that are involved with that. Um, what we do specifically um, is, is we do a, a mirepoix, sautéed mirepoix vegetable stock that, that, we, that we heat up to a nice warm temperature and then add the miso to be, before service. Um, I, I think that a, a lot of times it's, uh, it, correct me if I'm wrong, it's dashi is, is... Right, dashi is usually the traditional stock, but we, you know, you can do, you can put a French flair to it, like what you've done in your own twist with the, uh, the sweetness. Yes. Sure. Um, yeah, so da and dashi is essentially kind of a dried fish stock that, um, that, that you end up with. Um, we, we wanted to we wanted to also serve some sort of contrast here. I mean, there's the heaviness of the dumplings, there's the saltiness, and then the sweetness that that are with the pear and and ginger, and then we wanted to make sure that we had this crunchiness and freshness of the vegetables. We don't cook these vegetables at all. That is the absolute last thing that that goes into to this dish. Um, I, I think that that is important, and I think that's also very Asian. I think that they handle vegetables a lot better than we do. We tend to want to kill them uh, here, here in America. Well, would it be feasible to make something like this at home, and, and how would you go about doing it? Absolutely. Um, it is feasible to do it at home. Um, and, and again, the, the idea of, of cooking in any, any regard is, is to make it easy. And this mm -hmm. is a very easy soup. Um, probably the hardest thing that you're going to have to do with this is, is track down uh, miso. Um, grocery stores, you've seen it a lot more in grocery stores now. Um, they are in larger packages. Um, you can freeze the, freeze the miso, but you are then essentially killing the, the the living organism that right, it is. The, the health benefit that yeah. we're looking, that we're hoping um, to gain. But it, it, miso does serve a purpose as far as flavor goes as well. Um, this can be made um, if you make your vegetable stock a day ahead of time. Um, it can be refrigerated, so it's a matter of heating up that vegetable stock, having your vegetables cut. Um, you can roll out your, your dumplings as well um, and refrigerate them and uh, have everything on your stove. Uh, hot and ready to go where you're just assembling and you're able to enjoy your time with your guests as opposed to sitting over the, the stove. I mean entertaining in my mind is, is really about entertaining uh, your guests and not sitting in the, the kitchen. And so. the dumpling would would cook in the stock? You could cook the dumpling in the stock, yes. Um, I think that uh, I think it's better to, to separate it from it, um, but it absolutely could be uh, could be cooked in the stock. Anytime I'm under the the theory that anytime you bring something up to a uh, the rolling boil, um, that you, you kind of change the characteristics of it. You know, right. especially when you're dealing with stocks. Um, so well, I, I I hope that you you enjoyed this. <laughs> we're we're gonna we're gonna get to eating this, and um, and then we'll come back and and we'll talk about. Uh, about our next dish, which is a braised short rib that we that we do in sake and uh, some other fun stuff, and then we glaze it with uh, with a little bit of fruit and uh, and uh, and spice, and serve it with wasabi mashed potatoes. So um, it's fun to talk about this, but it's more fun to eat it. So. <laughs> it is so I think I think we should get to that, so we can move on to move on to the next course. So. When you're planning a restaurant, I, I really do think that you need to understand, um, well, there's a myriad of things you need to understand. You need to understand um, the community that you're involved in. 
I think you need to understand the economic climate that you're starting a restaurant, and I think you need to first and foremost understand the building that you're that you're in. You know, I mean, you can't you can't take a you know a 16th century cathedral and say that I want to do contemporary dining in it. You know, and that's an extreme example, but um, I, I think you need you need to let the building talk to you. I think you need outside influences, you know, to also talk to you. And I, I think you need to determine what you want to do to fit in within those confines. And again, this goes back to why you need to be flexible and you need to understand um, as a chef that you need to fit in. You can't make what you want to do fit uh, the circumstances that you're in. Prepping food is, you know, ultimately understanding how many how many people that you're you're doing. You know, I mean, it's as simple as it, it's not as glamorous as, as you would think it would be. It's it's a matter of saying, here's how many people we do on an average night. Here's how many uh, here's how many of these dishes that we go through, and it's a matter of keeping track of of, of how many of those things that that you go through. And then you have to, you know, if you have a slow week, if you have, a, you know, a, a good week, you have to be able to adapt to that as well. You, you have to be able to turn those into specials, turn them into soups. You have to, you have to be able to, to ultimately um, outlet whatever it is you over prep or under prep for that matter. Here at, at a, a Nava Tea Room, um, you know, ultimately what we're trying to do at a Nava Tea Room is we're trying to gain confidence in, in the, the community that we're serving. Um, in the same aspect is we're, we're also in-house trying to take um, people who, who aren't necessarily able to do what my ultimate vision is of this restaurant and, and get them up to speed. So really what we're trying to do at this point in time, early on in, in Anaba Tea Room's uh, ultimate goal is we're, we're trying to learn fundamentals of cooking. Then we want to kick off the shackles of tradition and that'll allow us to get to innovation. And when we get to that, that innovation is really where I think we'll truly find our voice. We have uh, our next dish is um, the aforementioned braised short ribs. Um, we had finished them off with a ginger and orange glaze, and then we served them over wasabi mashed potatoes, and then there's a little bit of a spring onion that goes over the top there, of these. There's nothing better than a great slow braised piece of piece of meat. Um, and I've gone out and we've had short ribs at, at some of our chef's dinners and things like that, and there's a, unfortunately, when you braise something, it, it can turn out good or it can turn out absolutely fantastic and I know this is going to be the latter but can you talk to to the fact that how do you what are the steps that going through these short ribs what do you do that to ensure that this is going to turn out absolutely fantastic yeah and, and I think you're right I, I think that there are steps to it and I do think that those steps a absolutely do distinguish a, a good short rib from a great short rib um, what I like to do personally is uh, I, I like to get them on the bone um, and I like to be able to cut them myself. I, that way I can control the size of the short rib and thus everything's gonna cook at the same time. Um, I think that's, that's incredibly important. Um, the second thing I like to do is I like to, I like to season them and leave them seasoned overnight before I get to the braising aspect of it. The, the third thing, and, and I believe this is, um, this can go one of two ways, but for me, I believe that they need to be grilled next. Um, 
So I, I grill our short ribs, um, and I grill them until I get a nice kind of caramel outside on them. I try and get as many grill marks, so I'm turning them one to two times on each side. Um, I, I, I try to get as much grill marks on there as possible. Um, the third thing is, is picking the braising liquid that, that you're going to you're gonna use for it. Um, sure. And when you when you say seasoning, we're, you're not just talking about salt and pepper. You, you're talking about a spice rub or something like yeah, that, right? Yeah, yeah. That's sure. a, a great question. Yeah. Um, I, I, I like um, many different ones. There's Most come from, uh, and I'm gonna give a local plug here, but the, the Spice House here in Milwaukee. Um, sure. They do a fantastic job. They have a, a great Chicago steak seasoning that works well yeah, on this. Yeah, there's no there's no hard and fast rule that says you can't have someone who does it just as well. To, you know, it's, great, it's great to make your own spice mix, and I make my own, but sometimes you find those great recipes. And, sometimes and, it, and the Spice House is a fantastic place for that. And sometimes it's a combination of it. Um, you know, there is actually um, a little bit of Chicago spice uh, mixture in here, but it's also something that I've added to it. Um, I do a little bit more garlic, a little bit more onion, um, and kosher salt. Um, but uh, after, after you're, you know, again done done grilling it, I think it's important that that you 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 pick something uh, braising liquid wise that that's going to complement whatever it is that you're serving it with. Now this in particular we're doing with uh, with with wasabi mashed potatoes. So. My braising liquid here is is a mushroom soy sauce, um, sake, and tamarind. Um, and then there's also a little bit of sugar in here in the braising liquid as well to bring down that sake aggressiveness. Okay. Um, we start at a very high heat. Um, we make sure that the that our, our ribs are covered all the way. We start out at a very high heat and then we gradually bring it down. Um, you're talking, you, you, everybody wants a hard and fast rule for, for cooking. Um, I don't believe there are hard and fast rules. I think you have to check all the way through where your tenderness is at. But I believe it's important to start at a high temperature and, and work down to a lower temperature. Even though you're softening, breaking down uh, the, the, the meat itself, um, you can tend to end up getting these dry if you go one flat line heat all the right. way through. Even right. though it's soft and moist and, and, and pulls apart, um, they can end up well, dry. Well, the fact that you started with the high heat to get that nice crust to accentuate what you've just done with the grilling process, and you slowly bring it down, let the, let the moisture permeate those tissues and break down that collagen and turn, turn it into gelatin and make it soft. Right. It, it, it is, you know, it, it, any kind of cooking is is a heat exchange, um, but with meat, you know, you're talking about moisture, and you're right. You're driving that moisture into the middle of the piece of meat, and that breaks up the, the meat, and then you're allowing it to release back into or back to the outside because heat wants to force um, it wants to force uh, water and, and liquid away from it. You know, and either that's out of the top and, and, or into the middle. And in this case, what we're trying to do is drive it into the middle so we can retain some of the moisture that. Uh, that we get here. Now, if we did these right, we shouldn't need a knife. Um. <laughs> now, before you get that bite in, <laughs> as a home cook, I'm interested in stealing your secrets, and I'm going to ask you to be a little more specific. Okay, you you come out of the out of your rub, out of your seasoning, and if there's pepper on there, well, pepper can burn, and 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 now, do you need to to take that? seasoning off before you hit the grill or is it just fine to to leave it right where it is and how long are we talking about on a grill are we talking about a really hot fire and it's on there for a, sh a short period of time turn it over to brown all all sides is that is that <coughs> sort of the process there? I think those are all really good questions I, I think you do have to be careful with your pepper especially if you're leaving it overnight um, because that is going to get into into the meat um, mm -hmm. so you do want to back off your seasoning um, a, a little bit um, but uh, as, as far as uh, grilling goes, uh, you do want very, very high heat because what you're trying to do is, is char that outside. You want that grill right. flavor and you want to be charred on the outside. Um, and, and, and again, try and kind of sear this in because now we're going to dunk it in liquid and this is where you can end up with ultimately a, a, a somewhat dry product. So. Or end result. And and one more thing about being specific. And again, if you're thinking about doing this at home, what do you do? I mean, do you heat up that braising liquid? beforehand or does it go into cool braising liquid? I, that is an excellent question, uh, Tom. Um, I, I have always done it in, in a cool liquid. Okay. Um, I just believe that, um, that and I start with, with, my, uh, with my oven, uh, um, I don't preheat it. 
I start it in the oven, crank it up to a temperature and bring it up to, to a high temperature slowly and then again bring it back down. Okay. And, and that seems to work and there's, there must be a reason okay. for that. But. I'm going to remember that trick. <laughs> <All right. laughs> well, we're out of time today. Um, I want to thank both of you guys for coming, Tom Strini and Jim Udelich, uh, for, for joining me here today and, and getting to talk about food. And, and um, we hope you enjoyed this, this, uh, this afternoon with us. And I'm um, your host, Chef Greg, and this has been Prep to Plate.